This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Moira Fogarty. The Gerard Street Mystery by John Charles Dent. Part 2. I don't know how long I sat there, trying to think, with my face buried in my hands. My mind had been kept on a strain during the last thirty hours, and the succession of surprises to which I had been subjected had temporarily paralyzed my faculties. For a few moments after Alice's announcement I must have been in a sort of stupor. My imagination, I remember, ran riot about everything in general, and nothing in particular. My cousin's momentary impression was that I had met with an accident of some kind, which had unhinged my brain. The first distinct remembrance I have after this is that I suddenly awoke from my stupor to find Alice kneeling at my feet and holding me by the hand. Then my mental powers came back to me, and I recalled all the incidents of the evening. "'When did Uncle's death take place?' I asked. "'On the 3rd of November,' about four o'clock in the afternoon. It was quite unexpected, though he had not enjoyed his usual health for some weeks before. He fell down in the hall, just as he was returning from a walk, and died within two hours. He never spoke or recognized anyone after his seizure. "'What has become of his old overcoat?' I asked. "'His old overcoat? Willie, what a question!' replied Alice, evidently thinking that I was again drifting back into insensibility. "'Did he continue to wear it up to the day of his death?' I asked. "'No. Cold weather set in very early this last fall, and he was compelled to don his winter clothing earlier than usual. He had a new overcoat made within a fortnight before he died. He had it on at the time of his seizure. But why do you ask? Was the new coat cut by a fashionable tailor, and had it a fur collar and cuffs. It was cut at Stovall's, I think. It had a fur collar and cuffs. When did he begin to wear a wig? About the same time that he began to wear his new overcoat. I wrote you a letter at the time, making merry over his youthful appearance, and hinting, of course only in jest, that he was looking out for a young wife. But you surely did not receive my letter. You must have been on your way home before it was written." I left Melbourne on the 11th of October. The wig, I suppose, was buried with him? Yes. And where is the overcoat? In the wardrobe upstairs, in Uncle's room. Come and show it to me. I led the way upstairs, my cousin following. In the hall of the first floor we encountered my old friend Mrs. Daly, the housekeeper. She threw up her hands in surprise at seeing me. Our greeting was very brief. I was too intent on solving the problem, which had exercised my mind ever since receiving the letter at Boston, to pay much attention to anything else. Two words, however, explained to her where we were going, and at our request she accompanied us. We passed into my uncle's room. My cousin drew the key of the wardrobe from a drawer where it was kept, and unlocked the door. There hung the overcoat. A single glance was sufficient. It was the same. The dazed sensation in my head began to make itself felt again. The atmosphere of the room seemed to oppress me, and closing the door of the wardrobe I led the way downstairs again to the dining-room, followed by my cousin. Mrs. Daly had sense enough to perceive that we were discussing family matters, and retired to her own room. I took my cousin's hand in mine, and asked, "'Will you tell me what you know of Mr. Marcus Weatherly?' This was evidently another surprise for her. How could I have heard of Marcus Weatherly? She answered, however, without hesitation, I know very little of him. Uncle Richard and he had some dealings a few months since, and in that way he became a visitor here. After a while he began to call pretty often, but his visit suddenly ceased a short time before Uncle's death. I need not affect any reserve with you. Uncle Richard thought he came after me, and gave him a hint that you had a prior claim. He never called afterwards. I am rather glad that he didn't, for there is something about him that I don't quite like. I am at a loss to say what the something is, but his manner always impressed me with the idea that he was not exactly what he seemed to be on the surface. Perhaps I misjudged him. Indeed, I think I must have done so, for he stands well with everybody, and is highly respected. 
I looked at the clock on the mantelpiece. It was ten minutes to seven. I rose from my seat. I will ask you to excuse me for an hour or two, Alice. I must find Johnny Gray. But you will not leave me, Willie, until you have given me some clue to your unexpected arrival, and to the strange questions you have been asking. Dinner is ready and can be served at once. Pray don't go out again till you have dined. She clung to my arm. It was evident that she considered me mad, and thought it probable that I might make away with myself. This I could not bear. As for eating any dinner, that was simply impossible in my then frame of mind, although I had not tasted food since leaving Rochester. I resolved to tell her all. I resumed my seat. She placed herself on a stool at my feet, and listened while I told her all that I have set down as happening to me subsequently to my last letter to her from Melbourne. And now, Alice, you know why I wish to see Johnny Gray. She would have accompanied me, but I thought it better to prosecute my inquiries alone. I promised to return some time during the night, and tell her the result of my interview with Gray. That gentleman had married, and become a householder on his own account during my absence in Australia. Alice knew his address, and gave me the number of his house which was on Church Street. A few minutes' rapid walking brought me to his door. I had no great expectation of finding him at home, as I deemed it probable he had not returned from wherever he had been going when I met him, but I should be able to find out when he was expected, and would either wait or go in search of him. Fortune favoured me for once, however. He had returned more than an hour before. I was ushered into the drawing-room, where I found him playing cribbage with his wife. "'Why, Willie!' he exclaimed, advancing to welcome me. "'This is kinder than I expected. I hardly looked for you before to-morrow. All the better. We have just been speaking of you. Ellen, this is my old friend, Willie Furlong, the returned convict, whose banishment you have so often heard me deplore.' After exchanging brief courtesies with Mrs. Gray, I turned to her husband. "'Johnny, did you notice anything remarkable about the old gentleman who was with me when we met on Young Street this evening?' "'Old gentleman? Who? There was no one with you when I met you.' "'Think again. He and I were walking arm in arm, and you had passed us before you recognized me and mentioned my name.' He looked hard in my face for a moment, and then said positively, "'You are wrong, Willie.' You were certainly alone when we met. You were walking slowly, and I must have noticed if any one had been with you. It is you who are wrong, I retorted almost sternly. I was accompanied by an elderly gentleman, who wore a great coat with fur collar and cuffs, and we were conversing earnestly together when you passed us. He hesitated an instant, and seemed to consider, but there was no shade of doubt on his face. Oh, have it your own way, old boy, he said. "'All I can say is that I saw no one but yourself, "'and neither did Charlie Leach, who was with me. "'After parting from you, we commented upon your evident abstraction "'and the sombre expression of your countenance, "'which we attributed to your having only recently heard "'of the sudden death of your Uncle Richard. "'If any old gentleman had been with you, "'we could not possibly have failed to notice him. "'Without a single word by way of explanation or apology, "'I jumped from my seat, passed out into the hall, seized my hat, and left the house. End of Part 2 The Gerard Street Mystery Read by Moira Fogarty October 2006